So thank you for coming or letting us come here to interview you, Mayor Hillary Sheedy. Before we do get started, though, I do have to ask, what should I call you? Should I call you Mayor? Call me Hillary. Call Hillary. Yeah. Can I call you Hill? You can I mean, call me like, Hill. You can can call me Hill. Okay. You okay. Can call me whatever you want to call me. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I just want to get that out of the way. Um, so I was going to open up with a simple question. Uh, so what do you do? What, what do I do? What do, you um, do? Well, obviously Ms. I'm Miss Hill. Yeah. Um, obviously I'm the mayor of Reno is, mm -hmm. is the position that I was elected for. And we obviously set policy in the city. We do actually a lot of different things mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you, you know, different, different functions of city government, um, whether it's from public works to streets to sewers. Um, we also... Uh, human um, service issues too. Services issues are really important to uh, the city of Reno. Um, anywhere from, I mean, you could take positions on anything from health care to infrastructure to tax reform. I mean, um, it's a very, I would say it's very broad, but typically the mayor is known as the role of sort of, I always say the cheerleader for the city, right? It's your job to go out there and okay. to promote your city in a, in a positive light. Just stepping right into okay. it. So what are the most pressing issues that you plan to fix if reelected? Um, well, you know, I think for mayors, there are a whole host of issues. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly whenever it, it comes to city, again, from infrastructure to health care, um, I think right now the biggest issue for me and also facing our community has been the homeless issue and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're, we're doing a lot in that retrospect, and it's really been um, very important to this council mm -hmm. to make that a priority. And we just um, approved going forward with Tiny Home Village, and a lot of cities are doing this, but they're creating it so that we can put roofs over people's heads instead of putting them into shelters and create a community around the tiny home village. And so um, that's something that uh, we just approved at the last council meeting, and you'll see projects like that come about. But, um, you know, right now, I think more than ever, it comes down to housing mm -hmm. and homeless issues, which kind of sort of comes back to, you know, something I'm very passionate about, which is mental illness and drug addiction. So, we, you know, those are very vulnerable populations that this council cares greatly about. Right. So with the with this tiny home thing, so how would that work? Is there a plan yet in motion for that? Like, how many people, yeah. like, is, is there a list of people right. who can get on it? I mean, how would that yeah. work? The tiny so home? I think that's a great question. So first of all, one of the things that we, we want to do is we want to make sure that this village has wraparound services. And what we mean by that is, like, caseworkers and social workers to be able to come in and provide the things that they need because mm -hmm. these can be populations that have disabilities, obviously need medication, certainly for me mental illness or drug addiction, things like that. But what we're going to do is we're going to partner with providers that are very familiar with that and that are experts in the field mm -hmm. so that they can continue to case manage um, the people that are living in these tiny home villages. Um, and it depends. We The city has quite a bit of land that we will put these villages on. And so we'll, we'll see from there. And I think um, we can start with about 40 tiny home villages. And so, uh, so it's actually kind of exciting. A lot of cities are doing it, and they're seeing a lot of success. That's awesome. Yeah. So as far as paying for this goes, um, where would all the money come from to yeah. have the contractors build them or whoever yeah. you're having build them? Great, great question. Mm -hmm. So what we're really looking at is doing a private and public partnership. And what we mean by that is the city will supply the land, right? And then we have also asked other developers that are obviously experts in this space to help financially and to also help build because they obviously are the experts in the space. And so it makes it um, a, a great relationship to partner with people's like, people like this in the in the community, mm -hmm. right? So um, we're partnering with other developers in the community that will bring money to the table, and they will also bring skills, and the city will bring land. Mm -hmm. So it makes for a really good relationship. Awesome, awesome. So moving on a little bit, um, so your main competition uh, for mayor is Brandon Seary. Um, I'm assuming that you know as the director of Kalimba. Um So you're Miss Midtown. 
uh, that's what some people call you. Your roots lie in Midtown, correct? You're kind of a... Well, my business was in Midtown, and we right. and, and there was a few of us that started Midtown together, the Midtown District, mm -hmm. um, obviously. And so, um, but now, you know, Midtown is obviously flourishing, and it's really grown up a lot mm -hmm. since we started it 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so now, um, our focus has really changed. Whenever I was elected, I really focused on wanting to revitalize downtown right. and really bring some of that momentum and energy into the downtown core. So um, so we're doing a lot to revitalize downtown. If you sort of look at it now, look, we have the King's Inn. Do you remember the King's Inn, how dilapidated, how right. what it was blight? Mm -hmm. um, and it had been vacant for 30 years. So if you look at that building now today, it's a beautiful, hip, um, you know, space for millennials and and people in tech that are sort of they gravitate to this this space and so um i think it's a very cool project and now whenever you walk past it you you're not reminded by you know the old blight that was once there so you're seeing the revitalization of that you're also seeing um if we look across the street at the post office all the um, incredible things that they've done with the post office. It's very entrepreneurial. It's very hip. The basement. Have you been down there? I have. Right? One of my favorite places. Right? Yeah. And we haven't seen retail downtown in decades. Mm -hmm. So to have West Elm here, to have Patagonia, mm -hmm. then you have the revitalization of the Renaissance. Have you been there? I haven't been inside. I've been oh. outside, though, and it looks pretty dang. you got to see <laughs> it, and it's amazing. And they've done a beautiful job. So a lot of different things are happening downtown. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, during the time of the recession, um, the city really had to lay off a lot of employees. And so we're really playing catch up from the work that sort of happened, you know, in the recession. And so um, so that has been a, a very big focus, trying to get us back to, um, you know, to today. We're just, you know, the city really suffered when we went into the recession. You have to remember, we were the highest for un um, foreclosures and unemployment. Um, and so, and that was next to Florida. So, uh, the state of Nevada took a huge hit. And so the cities really had to be diligent about playing catch up, but we really focused on, on downtown. And one of the things that we're doing is called, uh, the business improvement district down there. And that's something that all the businesses, um, sort of collaborate on. They come together. But what, what I love about the business improvement district and many cities are doing it and it's becoming very popular, um, and very successful. We actually went to Sacramento and looked at their model. And so we've seen it firsthand and we've seen it be successful. Mm -hmm. But one of the things the Business Improvement District will do, it will put um, in place what we call ambassadors on the street. Mm -hmm. And these are people that um, have backgrounds um, with, you know, homeless issues, with um, a variety of addiction issues. They're like a caseworker on the street. Okay. But they're also sort of an, an ambassador for downtown and can even give directions, right? Oh, okay. So um, so that's part of the process for, for what we call the business improvement district. Okay. And we really think putting boots on the ground in that capacity will be um, very welcoming, obviously, for our tourism, mm -hmm. but for also the the less fortunate that, you know, need services, that we've got to direct them to services, help them get services. Because you see it mainly in downtowns because people are coming down here certainly because they can, um, you know, they they can obviously be provided for better in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to help those people with the services that they need. So you're a busy woman. You're the mayor, if you didn't know. <laughs> so you host events as the mayor, and um, you have your city address. I believe it's a yearly event, correct? Yeah. So, um, so it's ten thousand dollars from the city's general fund. Um, so where does that money come from, the city's general fund? Well, that comes from various sources, and that's our our largest source mm -hmm. of income in the city. And um, absolutely, I think. Um, you have to look at the state of the city. It is one of the most important um, addresses that you can give. Mm -hmm. It really helps you connect with your community so they know what's been going on, so you can stay transparent. They know uh, what projects are happening in the city. They, um, it, it's a very, very important um, event to be able to connect with everyone because otherwise there are a lot of times that people don't pay attention to what's really happening in the city all year. <clears throat> so 
I really make it an event where I want people to come out. And we spent $10,000 um, for to make sure that people could get to the event for transportation and things of that nature. And so, um, and we had an attendance of over 700. Wow. And we had a lot of people um, view uh, the state of the city online. And I'm, I'm very proud of that only because um, in the past, it wasn't something that was attended well at all. I mean, it might have 100 people at it, and most of them would be um, city employees. And so I think, you know, we've worked really hard at trying to engage the community to be part of um, the state of the city. And so I look at it as it's a marketing tool that we have to spend money on to promote for people to come out and be engaged with their city, be part of it. And <clears throat> the city is... It's got a, a very, very large budget of over $400 million. And so $10,000 once a year to have people come out, your whole entire city invited, um, and be able to spread that message of what we're doing, whether from economic development to art, right? Mm -hmm. And to really show and highlight Reno, that's what we have to do. And then also, um, you know, when, when you... When you do it to that magnitude, it also helps tell the story across the country about what Reno's doing. Yeah. So a lot of national, a lot of national media um, picked up our state of the city, which I'm very proud about, mm -hmm. because it just tells the success story of the biggest little city. Whenever um, you can go out there and have a very strong state of the city, and um, you know, some people might criticize that, but it's it's just like a business. You would spend money. Um, advertising in your business to get people to come to an event. Um, that's how you promote what you do, and that's how you stay in touch with your your customers. Um, and for us, it's our citizens, yeah. right? And we sell a quality of life, and that's what we you know, talk about at the State of the City. So who do you invite? If there's 700 people, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of people. So who all came it's to a lot. the event? But not compared to the population. So <laughs> if we can, if we can have a hundred thousand, that would yeah. be great. Uh, we invite everyone. I mean, it's open to the public and it's free, and so and that's very important too. But it's. Um, <laughs> she, I love it. Let's run. What are you gonna do? Um, gonna do? But yeah, it's open to the public, and and we just invite everyone to attend. It doesn't matter you know, who you are, we just, you know, it's really important that people come and shape their city and, and hear about all the great work that's happening. So you give a speech, mm -hmm. I assume that. It's, right. So you have to give a speech, I mean, so what, you walk around, you talk to people, kind of let them know, I'm the mayor. No! <laughs> or is it more like, just like conversation, learning more what they want mm -hmm. as residents? Well, no, um, that's a little more town hall style. Okay. State of the city, you do, you give a speech, mm -hmm. and you really try to cover different things in the speech from your, your budget mm -hmm. to um, some of the projects that are developing throughout the city. Uh, you, you talk about um, certain developments that have happened over the year. You try to keep it very relevant. That's why we do it once a year. Mm -hmm. um, and then for me, I, I focused, like the first year, I did it at the University of Nevada, Reno. And it was great because students could come and experience the state of the city because most of them probably um, haven't attended the state of the city. So I thought it would be great to bring it to the university and really make it um, – and, and focus on sort of that relationship with the city and the university. So mm -hmm. that's what we did the first year. And I was proud because we had uh, over 500 attend. So that was great. So it really showed that the students were really engaged. And then um, the second year, last year, we did it at um, Atlantic Aviation. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really important because of the economic impact of the airport. Um, your, your airport is essential to a city and uh, all the economic development that it brings in and, and all the work that you do with airlines. And um, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, and I think a lot of people have not really heard the story of, of the airport or even seen the other side of the airport where we, we held it. So uh, we had 700 people. It was standing room only. So that, so that was nice. And it was just a really great event. So, yeah, I was very proud. And we had people come in um, from... Uh, Reno High, who came, they were an incredible band that came in, and we just really tried to, we had a student from Hug High School that um, spoke, who I thought was incredibly moving, and so we really try to, um, you know, 
put the community inside State of the City as well. The university, especially of Nevada, Reno, um, has kind of been in the news recently. I'm sure you've obviously heard about that with Colin Kaepernick uh-huh. and with um, the student who attended the Charlottesville rally. Um, so we've been having some debates and discussion of diversity on the Good, university yeah. campus, which is awesome. Um, yeah. So I guess what are your thoughts about the university being in the news and kind yeah. of how, how should we deal with yeah. this trouble of, yeah. you know, we're not as diverse as we want to be, unfortunately, and um, that topic. Well, obviously, you, you know, I think I'm very protective of of the city, obviously, because I'm the mayor, right? right. So anytime that, um, that we're featured in, in a negative light, obviously, is very hard for me to understand because we know the university completely different. Right. Um, you know, the way that someone might have a certain opinion about something is certainly not, might not be the majority of the students, mm-hmm. correct? And so, you know, obviously... Um, I never, ever like to see anything in, in, in our city being portrayed as negative. But I also think in some ways it's good to open up the conversation, to have those conversations, mm-hmm. um, because they are uncomfortable conversations, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think now more than ever it's important to be transparent about that and certainly have students um, you know, voice their concern and their opinions um, because we, we all have to, as much as you also might not respect the way that someone else thinks about something, you, you really have to sort of respect, uh, the freedom of speech in certain aspects, right? Mm -hmm. But it all has to be done respectfully and thoughtfully and in a way that we can have a productive conversation, um, because obviously, you know, violence isn't going to solve anything. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it's, it's important for students to have those tough conversations, right? Or things don't change. So I think, um, you know, I, I actually have to say I, I'm proud of the way that they've handled some of those struggles because mm-hmm. I'm sure it hasn't been easy. But that's one thing about the university that um, they're very resilient and they care about their students. Um, I've always been impressed with President Johnson and how open and how accessible he is to students. Mm-hmm. And he really cares. And so that's one thing that I think um, really sort of speaks to me about the university is that how much he really does care.